Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Yeadon and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. Impetus Digital actually has built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. And we work with life science companies across the globe to help them virtualize their in-person meetings. There, is no bit, there has been no better time than unfortunately since COVID-19 where people have had to try to do this to continue their businesses to do work, to gather insights, and to work with their collaborators. We've been helping companies with, their, with virtualizing their advisory boards, working groups, steering committees, doing medical education, and even things like brand plan, rollout, sales, and MSL training. But more importantly than that, at Impetus Digital, we really believe that everything starts with a conversation. And this is precisely the reason that we've started this podcast channel is that we can establish these big, hairy, audacious discussions and dialogues around concepts that are disruptive and they're intriguing and interesting and that are gonna move the needle forward so that we can all collectively positively disrupt the healthcare system that we all find ourselves in. So I'm so pleased to have these esteemed five panelists around the table today and I'm gonna introduce each, each of them. First of all, Dr. Daniel Fagbui. He's actually one of our distinguished ER physicians. He's a biodefense expert. He's also the chief medical officer, war veteran, assistant professor, and a media expert. He provides strategic leadership in public health literacy, biodefense, disaster preparedness, emergency management, and business continuity of operations, both nationally and internationally. And um, we also uh, have, uh, he's actually one of the first and youngest African Americans appointed to the National Biodefense Science Board to provide expert advice and guidance on complex issues of preventing and preparing for and responding to adverse health effects of public health emergencies. He's also the CEO of a company called Erudition. So very, very excited to have you here with, with us, Dr. Fabui. Thank you. We've also just had Dr. Jeffrey Mount Varner uh, join us. Um, thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to get in. Um, and he's a decisions expert. He's a multi best selling author, um, an international speaker, executive, and board certified ER doctor. He holds degrees and medical training from several top rated schools in the US including Harvard and Johns Hopkins universities. He was on the front lines of Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and he served as the chief and chair of a large urban ER during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. He led the emergency response for the Ebola crisis in 2014, and he currently works on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Jeff, so happy to have you. Moving on to our next esteemed um, panelist is Dr. Brian Block. Dr. Brian Block is an interventional pain physician. He's board certified in both anesthetology, and I know I mispronounced that, um, my lips are sticking today, and interventional pain management. He's always striving to provide the highest quality of care for his patients as part of the Maryland Pain Specialist team. Outside of clinical care, Dr. Block has an active interest in biotechnology and the business of medicine. So he consults in these areas through brianblockconsulting.com, so his own company. And his current areas of focus are managing the ever-changing healthcare environment, quality control, and regulations from CMS, state, and federal governments. So welcome, Brian. Great to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. We're also happy to have Mindy Cloud in with us. She has a bachelor's degree in sociology and a certificate in peace and conflict studies, as well as a master's degree in nonprofit management. She has an extensive experience in nonprofit management and public policy work. And currently she's the director of strategic initiatives with the Colorado Behavioral Healthcare Council. And in this role, she provides leadership to CBHC's work with members in key strategic areas, including payment reform, she conducts research and analysis, and develops strategic communications for their group. She also has a special interest 
in mental health and addiction research in medicine. So welcome, Mindy, great to have you. Hello, and thank you for having a behavioral voice today. Awesome. And last but not least, we're so pleased to also have Samantha Lapolis on our list of esteemed panelists. She teaches physicians and clinicians in private practice and how to plan, implement, and grow telehealth. And that again, for all of you joining today, today is the premise behind our discussion today is really around what it means to partake and sustain in telehealth. She's been implementing telemedicine for the last 10 years and works with clinicians to grow their practice, deepen their relationships with their patients, and even give them some work-life balance, whatever that means. She also runs a popular blog called Sam and I um, Innovates, where she answers common questions around telehealth, and she interviews doctors, nurses, and other healthcare innovators who share their firsthand experience and tips of the trade. So welcome, Sam, great to have you. Thank you so much, happy to be here. Thank you. So welcome to everybody. This is going to be a panel discussion, and we're basing this around the whole world around telehealth, telemedicine, and lots of questions around what this means to us today. So we would be remiss not to talk about the fact that something pivotal has happened in all of our lives starting as early as February, March of this year. And that of course is the COVID-19 pandemic. Telehealth has been around for numerous years, 10, 11, 12 years. And it has been unfortunately since this pandemic that we have seen a huge inflection point of utilization of telemedicine. So I'd like to go around this virtual table, starting with you, Dr. Fabui, to find out about what telemedicine did or didn't mean to you prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, and what has happened in your practice, in your institution, since this horrible situation has arisen. So let us know what has been going on in your world. Uh, thank you for having me um, and uh, to my colleagues uh, who are on the panel. Um, telemedicine, I guess uh, we've been seeing the trends. Uh, and in my purview, uh, I look at it from the biodefense kind of public health standpoint. Um, we've been talking about this is, you know, the new wave. Uh, so some of the examples are, uh, and I'll also put in my military background in there, we looked at what we call the sights and sounds. Um, so there are certain things that you can't really appreciate. Uh, so during wartime, where we are at different locations, you might not have enough uh, providers or somebody to be able to give care on the battlefield or in a remote area. We would look at using and leveraging the technology to be able to get a good idea of what's going on, but not only what's going on to be able to educate the soldier on the field to be able to implement certain life-saving measures but also what's also in the background. So what's the threat and the visions, the sights that you see, what's the sounds? Um, so you kind of get a little idea of maybe even terrain. Uh, another in-depth look at it, the uh, intangibles that you don't actually tend to capture when you're just interacting um, in person or when you get a story over the phone or a, um, a call or an email. So now you get the visual piece of it. So you get to see a bigger picture. It's still a piece of a puzzle but it helps. So to the real world, to the civilian world, when we're now on, on land, uh, a classic example is emergency care. We have our frontline workers who are on the field. There's a car accident. This is in peacetime. There's a car accident that occurs. You want to know what happened as an emergency physician, how much intrusion was into the vehicle, how bad was the damage, what did the scene look like? We don't sometimes get that handoff when we have an exchange with a doctor versus the uh, emergency um, technician who's on the field because we may be seeing another patient at the time. And by the time we get to the other patient, the acute patient, we might miss that story. But with leveraging technology, um, these are things that we're looking forward to in the future. And during these times, also during these times of COVID, to be able to get a good picture of what's going on in the background. I also give another example of the social situations that you sometimes can see for example, in a pediatric uh, population, let's say a child who was abused or they went to the family house and there's an interaction, or maybe it was just a regular well check, a child who had maybe an ear infection and they actually 
got to interact with their doctor. But the doctor also gets a picture as we all get to see the backgrounds of all of us. Like you see the plant in my background, but maybe you see some other thing going on, God forbid, a violent action or even just that the house is unkempt, just as a glance that raises the index of suspicion. It gives us more detail. It can be a little bit intrusive, but those are the, some of the merits and demerits of leveraging that technology and how that information can be um, useful for us. Fantastic. That's really, really good insights. And I like some of those really useful examples of how it can be used really positively. So moving to you, uh, Dr. Varner, what has been your experience of telemedicine prior to COVID and post-COVID, both the good, the bad, and the ugly? Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, prior to COVID, <clears throat> uh, within the emergency medicine space, uh, the experience mainly was with stroke patients and the neurology patients. And from the practitioner's point of view, um, that wasn't viewed as very good for me because I felt like, you know, again, I've got my ER hat on. I would much rather have the neurologist there with me than at home. Um, but for those sites where there weren't a neurologist, it was added benefit. Now, during COVID, what I've noticed is, is that for patients who have technology, it gave them consistent access to their doctor um, and a few ERs even had it set up where they could live into somebody, uh, into a provider in the, in the ER. So it gave the privilege um, access to doctors right away. Now, having led first line responders in the past, for a paramedic or an EMT to have access to it, uh, uh, as Dr. Dan was I saying, that would be fantastic. But what I do know, it, is, it has innovated and changed medicine in such a way that it has improved access to healthcare. And, and it has allowed us as providers to change the world. And why do we need to like, change the world? Because the world needs to be changed and it's the right thing to do. So telemedicine is here to stay. We just have to figure out a way to make sure that everyone has um, equitable access to it. For sure. And I think you bring up some really important points because somebody may debate you on has it in fact actually increased access or has it exacerbated the digital divide that we hear so much about. Um, and, you know, this is we'll get into this in, in a few minutes really around infrastructure issues and the big rush that we're all going to around 5G and being able to provide basic infrastructure such as Internet in the rural communities example. So. Um, and then, of course, in the underprivileged and the vulnerable populations, are they truly getting access? So it's an interesting point, and I, I think we're going to come back to that. So moving towards you, Dr. Block, I was just curious about your viewpoints. Is telemedicine going to be a new panacea? Is it the new norm? And what do you think about this, especially in light of what the accelerant that COVID-19 has been in this, in this foray? Um. I think some elements of telemedicine is going to be the new normal, but it, it's not going to cure all of our, our ills. Um, you touched on the digital divide. I, I see it every day. My divide is less socioeconomic and more. I have a lot of older patients who have difficulty accessing the technology. Um, so not going to cure all ills, but has been a lifesaver for my practice. Uh, has allowed us to continue seeing patients during pandemic times with an older panel like we have, they remain at home because they are a high risk group. Uh, even where we are currently case counts are low, but they don't wanna go out and, and I don't wanna bring them out for things that can be handled at home. Um, we get more and less data. Dr. Fagbui touched on this. Um, I'm not seeing anything quite as exciting as a car accident or, or dangerous situations in the back, but. Most of my patients, you know, video in from some part of their home. So I, I learn more about that. Um, we get less information from the physical exam, but more information about their home life. Um, overall, I, you know, like I said, I think we're going to continue doing telemedicine in some form. Uh, I'm, you know, lobbying, talking to my representatives to make sure that uh, our Congress makes the, the rule changes necessary to continue that. Very interesting. I want, would like to come back to that because I think there's some good things about what we're going to need to do around legislation, regulation, et cetera, on that. 
So Mindy, moving towards you, since you actually do a lot of work around sort of the addiction, mental health space, um, COVID-19 has just been such a pivotal place, and I'm sure we're going to be doing research on this for years and years to come. In some ways, it could have actually inflicted some PTSD on some people. It's just that the isolation and um, so many other things that have impacted people, and we've seen some of these even short-term results on addiction and all sorts of other things that are going on. Can you speak a little bit around what COVID-19 has done on this, but more specifically how telemedicine has been implemented to sort of be a bit of a bridge gap, if you will, with some of the issues that have been, have up, have been coming up? Sure. So before COVID, there were behavioral health providers that were using telemedicine. Predominantly, it was being used for psychiatric shortages and to, to you know, increase access to care to psychiatric treatment. Um, but with COVID, many behavioral health providers, all of the community mental health centers that I work with, pivoted very quickly to doing telehealth much more broadly, to offering support groups, to offering um, therapy, individual and family therapy, um, offering community-based supports, doing Facebook Live uh, supports to the community on things like how to manage stress during this time. Um, what we found really quickly in doing this pivoting was, you know, what was mentioned earlier around this digital divide, that we really needed to get um, technology in the hands of patients. We needed to invest the time to make sure that they knew how to use that technology. But the flexibility that was allowed to start doing telephonic services really helped significantly with that. So that, you know, being able to not have to worry about bandwidth, but to provide um, behavioral health services via the telephone has made it um, much easier to, to ensure that access to care. Now, with that said, it's really important that we view telehealth as a tool in the clinical toolbox, because there are um, populations for which telehealth does not work as well. And, um, you know, it, it's important to many of our clinicians to be able to um, see the patient and to be able to interact with them face to face so that they can read their body language and that they can get a, a more full sense of what the patient is experiencing, which of course you cannot do telephonically. Um, it's also really important that we think about telehealth within this continuum of services because people with behavioral health conditions may have more acute needs at one point in time than they do initially. And so being able to move clients from telehealth services to face-to-face -face services, you know, having that direct connection to community-based care can be a really important um, way of making sure that folks don't end up and in more costly services, you know, don't end up in the emergency room or in uh, inpatient hospital or uh, other kinds of institutions like the criminal justice system. Yeah, fantastic and so, so important and so relevant. Um, and like I said, there's probably just gonna be years and years of research and some of the work that teams like your, you know, people like yourself and other teams in this space are doing on that. And so, Sam, I'd love to kind of tap into what you're doing in the world that you live in around education um, in everything and with all things that, that relate to change, you have the bell curve of, of adoption. You have the early users, which is probably the people around this virtual table. <laughs> and then you have a lot of people in the mushy middle and then there's gonna be late adopters, people who just can't, you know, can't get in or who aren't gonna do this. So tell us a little bit about what you do how you educate and some of the things that you're running into around adoption. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good uh, starting point because, because I've been doing this for 10 years and served really as a telemedicine director in large health systems and then came out and said, look, we're missing this gap for docs in private practice or advanced practice, nurse practitioners, physician assistants who are really solo practitioners and this kind of knowledge tends to be inside of big health systems or potentially in tech companies. So for me, it was really important to see what could that look like. And I think what I've seen is actually similar. You have early adopters, people are like, yes, I'm into doing something different. Let's give it a whirl. And then you have these really, I think what COVID did is it caused a lot of practitioners to be voluntold to do something. And with all due respect to the docs on the panel, 
working with docs for the last 10 years, you're not the most excited about change. I mean, that's just real. So to be hammered into telemedicine from one day I have an open practice to the next day my practice is closed is very difficult. And what I've seen through the years is clinicians, whether you're a physician or a nurse, you go in because you want to be connected to people. And so one client I've been working with is they're actually a nurse home visit program. And they obviously couldn't go in people's homes anymore. They serve first time low income moms. And because the nurses weren't comfortable on camera, they all started using the phone. What started happening is patients started or clients started dropping out. Nurses wanted to resign. They weren't feeling that connection anymore. And so I was brought in and we're calling it camera confidence, but some of it's just basic tech stuff. How do I use this tech? How do I um, actually get, for example, we've done full assessments. Oh, you do a house assessment? Okay, let's figure out how we do that on a cell phone. How do we coach a client on where to put the phone so that when the toddler is grabbing at it, you know, they can still do these things. So I think the amount, what I've always seen in these last, now it's actually 11 years, is you have to commit to the learning. The learning is a very significant part of it. And the other thing that I just will never come off this mountaintop is workflows. This is not the same as someone, even if, if you think about the ED docs and stroke, we spent months training the nurses and the ED docs. How do you interact with a stroke doc? How do you make this all work right? How does this fit into your workflow? These things are essential because there is this perception of, oh, well now you do Zoom happy hours. Yeah, just hop on and do a patient visit. You'll be good to go. Don't you Skype with your grandkids? You'll be fine. But that's not the same at all. This is a completely different way. So I spend a lot of time in that space of the education. Um, how are we adjusting your workflows? And how do we ensure we have clinician champions? If you do not have the highest level clinician within your organization or your practice who is bought into this, you are, you are dead in the water for sure. Oh my God, so many brilliant pearls of wisdom there, Sam. I absolutely love this. I'm gonna move actually back to Dr. Fabui as well because I think you, you mentioned something that's so pivotal and that is around, we are habit forming creatures right? Every one of us in our, in your, in your medical practice, you know, there's a flow. And even recently, you know, even the, the application of PPE, there's a sequence, right? And it's posted everywhere. And this is how you, and that's a workflow. Similarly, like you were saying, Sam, how you interact with people and who you're seeing and what time and what, how, how are you leveraging the EH, you know, the electronic health record, et cetera. So Dr. Fabio, in your opinion, you know, based on things like the fog behavior model and how we develop habits, what sorts of insights or, or um, advice would you give to other physicians around adoption of this? Like, you know, what were some of the things that worked for you and especially as it relates to creating new habits and new ways that you set up your day? Yeah, I think to, to Sam's point, it's really a, an education uh, process. You have to have buy-in from the top, um, and that's at the C-suite level uh, in any healthcare system. Um, it's just the way, things, the way things move. In addition, I, I do think we have to realize and take a step back and say, uh, practicing medicine, it's an art. It's a privilege for us, and we do like to engage with our patients. They're, again, the intangibles that you just can't pick up just by looking at them on a the screen. Um, and the technology doesn't give us that 3D view of everything. And then that tactile sense, some innate things that you learn as a physician or as a person who cares about people, uh, doctor, nurse, I mean, uh, allied healthcare providers, there's that sixth sense that it's an intangible, it's an immeasurable. You just have that gut feeling. I, I noticed that body language. I noticed that eye. I noticed the, the way you kind of responded, that intonation and in the way you said a certain thing. So those things, we have to respect that and say that, yes, those are things we're going to miss out on. I think the acceptance of that is important. And to understand that it's not the end all, uh, to, to Brian's point, this is just an opportunity for us to uh, be able to get a little bit closer to our patients during times of when we can't or when it's not as convenient. But we have to really weigh the merits and demerits, and let's talk about it. The whole points are that you are able to be able to 
uh, still generate revenue for a healthcare system or for a provider by still engaging with your patient and not losing that patient panel to, that you've developed and still keeping that relationship on. That's important. And for the patient, they want that satisfaction of being able to, I just wanted to talk to my doctor or I just need them to phone in this uh, script. I need them to send this off. I need a quick rapid note that just says, hey, I can return to work or I cannot return to work, COVID time or not COVID time. And then we have to look at the parts that where there's certain things. Maybe somebody wants to do a detailed neurologic exam and they're not able to do all of that. There's certain things you, uh, that you have to rethink. So it's kind of a rethinking of how we approach the physical exam of a patient and the patient encounter. So I think those are the challenges going forward that we need to realize. And then the whole reimbursement thing, we have to look at it from the patient perspective also and the provider perspective, where some uh, patients were saying that they felt, you know, they were taking advantage of it. They said, I didn't have to come to your office. I didn't stay in any space. I didn't get that personal touch. And yet you're going to charge me the same amount that I would have had where, when I, you know, when I could have been there in person. Well, there's the other side also that doctor does take that time. It's still that area of expertise or, or nurse or whoever in that healthcare field. There's a service being offered. And balancing that, I think, needs to also be discussed. Some people may feel a different way about it, but if we start to find that balance, I think we'll be able to, uh, to move forward um, with the new technology age. Yeah, I think that that's brilliant. And I think thinking things through, this is going to take a while. It's new roadmaps. It's new policies. It's trying new best practices, failing, pivoting, failing, pivoting, and continuing to experiment. And I'm really interested in your perspective, Dr. Varner, on is this a new revelation of what it means to be a physician? There's been a historical view about what that means. There's a component of empathy, of patient management, of touching and feeling and being with the patient. And we actually all know about books like written by like the Eric Topols of the world or all about digitization and the robotics of the world. And this is really just the start. It's the tip of the iceberg of, of what's to come in the future. Are physicians going to change? Are they going to become one day potentially glorified data scientists mm -hmm. where suddenly their role is going to be coming more of an analysis of data outcomes that are going to be entered through uh, passive sensors and facial recognition software and other sort of, you know, wearables and smartwatches, and then you're just there to analyze. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts as it relates to the evolution of the physician definition. Uh, thank you for that question. And um, I think all that you said will eventually happen. It's just that none of us will be alive by the time that happens. Uh, having, having said that, I think it context is everything. It just depends, for instance, what type of, what type of physician you are. For instance, um, having gone through 25 flu seasons as an ER doctor, I can tell you that about 60% of those patients, I could, have had a, I could have had a video call and they, didn't need, they, didn't, they did not even need to come in. Um, but then that, that brings us back to the digital divide issue. There are many patients who don't have access to, to, to the resources to have an online um, live video chat. Um, I think that the physical exam, I'm gonna pivot, I think that the physical exam is important, but, but to put context on it, um, history tells me a lot too. I think that when I walk into a patient's room live and he or she is sitting up uh, eating chips, that sends me a different message than when they get on the video and they are purposely, uh, well, not purposely, where it's, there's a tendency for patients to want to appear sick. So it just depends on the context. But I think that, the, that this COVID crisis is a great opportunity, I'm going back to the digital divide, to bridge that. I know in a state level committee that I sit on in Maryland, what is happening is, what's happening is they're giving the iPads out to families. They're giving, they are making sure that families out in rural areas now have access to Wi-Fi. So I believe that during this period, whatever it is that we need, we, we, we cannot let a good crisis go to waste. So whatever we need to maximize it as relates to, to the, to the physician patient care 
relationship we should maximize during this period of time. Absolutely. So absolutely important for sure. Um, Dr. Block, um, you know, especially interested in some of the work and probably people that you've been speaking with in your consulting business um, mm -hmm. and wanting to get a bit of an understanding about what's working for people and what's not. What, like, what is, what is the big white elephant in the room that nobody's kind of talking about here? Um, well, I'll just tell you my dog is lower down and also asking for attention. <laughs> um, the, on the consulting side, I, you know, I've, I've talked to some folks about doing research. Um, I haven't seen, and we have, we, we have an appointment coming up next week, I think, with a, a group to talk about how to automate our forms. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer your question, but I'll, I'll pivot a little bit. Uh, one of our problems has been getting the information into our EMR. Uh, previously, patients would come in and hand us their information, whether it was forms they filled out or we could look online and find their radiology reports or we would gather that information from an in-person visit. Obviously, most of the in-person visit we can do, but we do a lot of psychometric testing uh, in a chronic pain field. It helps us you know, select patients for who's appropriate for which therapy. And getting those forms in has been a challenge. Um, we can mail them to patients, they don't mail them back. We can email them to patients, they don't always want to scan them and send them in. Uh, we're talking to a company about having a whole online form. But if, you know, if you're a practice like ours where you use things like an SF36 or an Westry disability, these are multi-question forms that patients pretty much fill out pretty well on their own on paper, but aren't going to spend, you know, an hour on a smartphone clicking through, you know, uh, uh, an online form. Um, so that's, you know, one area that I definitely see some room for, you know, the various EMR vendors to dramatically improve the products we have. All of us physicians, we have a love and hate and probably more hate than love relationship with our EMR. Um, if patients were able to fill out the data that we're putting in the EMR, they filled it out at home. I, I think physician satisfaction with EMRs and telehealth would skyrocket because then you could be a doctor again, even if it's a virtual doctor, you'd spend much less of your time entering data, which is a huge dissatisfier. More so in, you know, in, in fields where you enter a lot of data, like primary care, you know, doctors are dramatically dissatisfied. You know, patients, fields like mine, where I spend a fair amount of my time doing interventional care, I'm still doing what I trained to do and I don't have to spend quite as much time on a computer. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that's, that's been very apparent to us is that we have to be flexible and our patients have to be flexible. We have a primary telehealth platform, but we have two secondary methods for patients who can't figure it out. I have talked to patients on the phone, on the landline phone while I'm looking at them on the video or on their wife's phone talking through her hearing aids to my patients. Um, so everybody has to be flexible. Right now, six months into pandemic, everybody is still very understanding, physician-wise and patient-wise. Um, you know, two years from now, I'm not sure whether people will be quite so willing to put up with hassles. Yeah, really um, good points. Sorry, go ahead. Was there anything um, else? And, yeah, the only other thing I have is in, in my world, my digital divide is both socioeconomic and age-related. Um, if you take care of older folks, they have so much trouble with technology. Um, previous iterations, I think, you know, the grandson might have come over and helped grandma with the iPad, but now the grandson's not allowed in the house. Um, so in my world, digital divide is both, you know, income, can you afford the devices? Can you afford Wi-Fi? A little bit urban rural. I have some patients who I see them in their car because they had to drive to the high school to get better Wi-Fi access. Because in Maryland, the, the high schools have been made Wi-Fi uh, hotspots, which is wonderful. Um, luckily, my patients can can drive their car, or their truck to go there. Um, but also age related, you know, some of my 80 year old patients not going to come in. Uh, but those are patients now, at least we're fortunate enough to be able to bring some patients in. And I have managed the inability to get a physical exam. Some patients, well, I saw you on Tuesday on the phone, and you're going to come in next time. Uh, so we can actually do an in person exam. Yeah, so many important points there. And I'm going to bring this actually from Mindy's perspective, because we've actually just spoke there for a few minutes around issues around interoperability and the ability for people to transfer information between patient and physician and physician to patient and 
somewhere in there, there's other people, there's pharmacists and there's e-scripts and there's other people who aren't using that. And then there's, you know, there's all kinds of other things in between allied healthcare providers, et cetera. So how do we manage that communication channel while at the same time dealing with these various populations that either do or don't have access to the, the, you know, this very seamless system. So, um, I mean, this is very important, especially as it relates to, you know, this whole addiction, um, mental health space, which is gigantic. And there's been so much impact of this on people since COVID. So any thoughts that you have on uh, and what you've seen and how people have maybe uh, tried to supersede some of these issues? I think many of the things that you're asking about have to do with like larger, you know, fragmentation within the healthcare delivery system. And those things cannot necessarily be solved by um, telehealth, right? So I think we need to be thinking about telehealth as again, you know, kind of how does it augment clinical services, not replace other services. Um, I think that the uh, reference before to, you know, getting numerous forms that need to be signed, you know, in behavioral health, there's additional documentation that needs to be signed due to, uh, I mean, at least in the United States, 42 CFR part two. So um, getting a signed release of information from clients, getting um, signed, you know, consent to treat. Um, so to the extent to which we can um, make that verbal, or um, automated that you can sign it electronically, that's going to significantly you know, help facilitate um, the delivery of telehealth services. I also wanted to circle back to the comment that was made earlier about what does this actually cost, you know, both for the, from the patient perspective and from the clinician perspective, because I think one of the mistakes that's being made right now in some policy circles is to think about telehealth as a way of saving money rather than thinking about it from the perspective of the triple aim. Um, because if you look at telehealth solely as a means to cut costs, then you're not thinking about provider capacity to make sure that you have both in-person services and telehealth services. And you're not thinking about, you know, how do you ensure the quality of care and how do you ensure a, a, a high level of patient experience. So we really need to, in all things related to healthcare um, policy, you know, be thinking about how do we put the, the patient in the center, um, how do we think about the triple aim, and um, how do we see telehealth as an important component of that, but not something that's going to be a panacea. Um, cost is such an important issue here, but here's the other piece of this, as I guess as people consider the holistic meaning behind telehealth, is now you may no longer be limited by the geographical parameters that I only see this physician because this is where I live and where they're located. We're, we're, we're uh, potentially in a place where each and every one of you can deliver your services globally. This is now the world that we live in. So what does that world look like? Does that increase the number of physicians? Does it decrease it? Does it increase the opportunity for other nurse practitioners and other healthcare deliverers, if you will, to augment and support your work. So Sam, I'm just kind of curious about your perspective about this whole holistic picture as it relates to cost and as it also relates to legislation and compliance and other things associated with billing codes and what you sort of see um, around advocacy on what the future should hold as it relates at a governmental level. Yeah, well, so I've done a lot of work actually in Colorado. I helped pass parity laws here by testifying in front of the House and Senate in the state of Colorado, and we did that several years ago. And even within that, because people still didn't believe they could really get paid for telemedicine, people still weren't doing it. So that's been a funny thing. The pandemic comes, people are like, oh, look, Colorado pays. And they have for the last three years, but you know, you've got to <laughs> learn it in the moment. So I think the things that I would say on, on legislation and advocacy, the hundred percent we think we need right now, which no one has, there's still no bills that are in process. Congress needs to change the wording that um, telehealth is only allowed in rural professional health shortage areas and that the patient's home is not an acceptable place of service. Those are acts of Congress. So 
only Congress can change that. That's a rule within the Social Security Act. So if they would just cross out that rural part and say home is an acceptable place of service, then Medicare would be able to bill like you are now to see a patient through video from their home. And of course, the CMS law would then flow down to all private payers. So we have about 13 states that do have private insurance are required by law to reimburse for a video visit from a patient's home in any geography. But until we have that come from the feds, then Medicare is this holdout. And if you look at someone like Dr. Block's practice, if he has elderly patients, that means he has a huge Medicare population. And we can't keep asking doctors to have one more thing on their checklist. Oh, hey, if this patient has this insurance and wears pink socks on Tuesdays, you're in, you'll definitely get paid for that service. <laughs> that can't be the standard, right? We need it much uh, easier because that is a barrier to adoption. And everyone always talks about the need for rural, which I agree 100%, but here's the reality. Most people live in urban areas. A doctor has to know they can get paid by their urban patient the same way they get paid by their rural patient. And that's one thing we can talk about in advocacy is, look, by getting rid of the geographic restriction, we will actually hurt, help rural patients more. Because now, again, you don't have to have pink socks on Tuesday to get paid for this service. And that's really a big barrier. I think in terms of expansion worldwide and things like that, I mean, the U.S. has very restrictive guidelines. So can we open it to broader? Yes, but of course you would still have to follow all US policies on the way in. And as we know, if you've been foreign trained, you have to go back through fellowship and everything here, right? So that, that doesn't change that. But what we have seen, for example, obviously Nighthawk service that's been around for you know decades where you have that. And what we are seeing is that, for example, some of the ICUs where the foreign trained people have come here and worked, they're going back to Israel, Australia. And now you've got a great thing because they were already working in the States, licensed in the States. Now they're doing EIC, you're basically doing night hawk service, but in other medical specialties. And now no one works nights. There we go. Every doctor mm -hmm. likes that idea, right? If I don't have to be the person who's up all night long on call. So we're seeing that a little bit more. Um, I think for American clinicians to have a broader reach, yes, but again, you have to be so careful about your licensing and all that kind of thing. You don't want to put your license at risk. So there's those nuances um, of how do you do that? How do you do that within legality? And how do you make sure you're keeping your credentials um, safe within US requirements? Oh, so many good things there. And um, I'm going to ask Dr. Fabuli as well, too, is in the line of that, is, you know, we're, we're upcoming to a, you know, a U.S. election fairly soon in a couple of weeks. I'm just curious from your perspective, with all of this that's going on, and there's so many different things that are going on and battling back and forth with the incumbents, is do you feel that healthcare is um, an issue that's being appropriately addressed? And if not, I mean, what would be the call out that you would be asking for there to be focus on and what would you like to be seeing in uh, uh, in the you know coming from the next US president um yeah great uh, question and great time uh, the debate is tonight <laughs> um yeah i i think one of the big things is obviously access to care and access almost universal if anything that's what we want um I think ACA has moved forward and done a significant job. We don't need that stricken down. That's my personal perspective. I think um, any candidate that's um, trying to vie for the presidency needs to definitely weigh that significantly. And now with the uh, some of the points which my uh, colleagues have made, especially with regards to leveraging technology, um, not just for convenience, but quality, standard care and rules around that need to be revisited uh, rigorously. Um, and um, yes, to access, to allow for access for more physicians, uh, providers of all um, levels um, across the state lines, I think is important. The international piece, I think will be a difficult challenge because we have certain standards and our expectations and those things. But at least for America, I think it's, huge and it's very important to be able to um, ensure that everybody has 
good access to care and also being able to leverage that technology to even search our availability so they have the variety of providers that people can actually have access to. So yes, that would be my, my big ask. And Dr. Varner, in your opinion, as we sort of project into the future, is what other novelties and things do you see as being additive to this new paradox that we're in and this new revelation about how medicine is going to be practiced? Uh, for example, do you see there being like Bluetooth type of tools and stethoscopes and other kinds of measuring tools? Is this is what it, what are you most excited about and what do you want to see happen in the next five to 10 years with, uh, with this new frontier? With this new frontier, um, most importantly, ways to improve, I don't want to call it a physical exam because we are not there, um, but ways to get uh, vital signs from the patient um, uh, uh, whether, whether it be Medicare pays for the device that someone just presses the button and gives me a, a blood pressure and a heart rate and it comes back uh, to me. Um, I, 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 I think small steps are going to be key. Uh, but I keep going back to this, but the digital divide is how we will maintain, I mean, improving that is how we will maintain um, a healthy U.S. population, because otherwise, the underserved, as we know, they get sick, they spread their like sickness onto um, others. And I think, as it relates to healthcare, I mean, you know, we're out of politics, but it just amazes me that we are discussing about losing 30 million people off off of healthcare, especially knowing that COVID now is a pre-existing condition for which we all know we don't know how long those pre-existing conditions are going to last. Yeah, so many good points. And Dr. Block, in your perspective, you know, we're now transmitting information through the internet, right? Mm -hmm. It's on the cloud somewhere, <laughs> in a way and in an immensity that we've never seen before. What are the concerns that you're hearing around cybersecurity, um, you know, risks, health, you know, private information, you know, what, what are you hearing and what would be some of the things that you would be concerned about or legislation that you would like to see moving forward on that, on that uh, domain? Well, getting to what Dr. Varner was, was speaking of, um, I would love to see better outcomes, physical outcomes measured by heart rate, steps, pulse ox. And these things are all now commercially available on a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or a Garmin device, or there's, I think, 20, I don't know, 10 or 20 other manufacturers. Um, but all that data is now, you know, protected health information. That's all PHI. Um, if it goes back to Google or to Apple, you know, they need to comply with HIPAA just like I do, uh, just like we all do. Um, I don't think that's yet being hacked. I don't think anyone has any great information, you know, reason to know someone's blood pressure. Um, I think the genetic data is much more, you know, susceptible and, and that concerns me, you know, the... 23 and me there's there's a lot of public there's a lot of protected health information out there that's incredibly meaningful um, on a on a on a separate note just talking about some of the the access to care i mean i definitely see that telehealth telemedicine can improve access to care dramatically relatively cheaply uh, one of one of my concerns you know as as a local doc is my practice uh, suddenly i could be competing against the mayo clinic because my patients in, you know, were in Maryland could access Mayo Clinic Telehealth from Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and I do see a role for legislation that um, if a patient is gonna be in a specific geographic area, probably on the state level, they need to be able to see their doctor, um, even if it's a two hour drive versus, you know, traveling all across the country. Um, and someone had mentioned about uh, improving access to rural care by making the rules uniform across the state and the, and the country. I think that's wonderful. And that would, and by all means, I could treat patients in rural Maryland um, who don't have access to care um, pretty easily. And if you wanted to actually incentivize rural medicine, you know, a lot making, you could incentivize that directly, but still allow telehealth for everything. Um, I think that was about it. And I guess the other issue was on costs. Um, it is really not cheaper to provide telehealth services right now uh, at all. 
Um, I could see a time when it might be cheaper, but I doubt it because by the time we're providing telehealth, I'll have days where I see three patients on telehealth and three in the office and three downstairs in the surgery center. Uh, and I have to maintain, you know, staff and space and computers for everybody. Uh, who does save money though are the patients. Patients save money on telehealth because they don't have to drive, they don't have to get a driver, they don't have to do anything other than, you know, talk to me from their couch. So the way to really import cost savings in terms of the triple aim, you can provide better care, you can provide cheaper care from the patient perspective. Um, but I do get the sense that CMS is very concerned about overutilization. Um, and there have been a couple of stories of evidently practices billing more hours than there are. So that's an issue. You'll, you'll get that everywhere though. <laughs> so yes. in all cases. Um, and so Mindy, just your thoughts that, you know, we have a large ecosystem of life science companies that, you know, we work with pharmaceutical, biotech, uh, medical device, et cetera. I'm just curious about your perspective on education. You know, normally people have gone to go, to go and visit physicians, you know, uh, allied healthcare providers, other people, they've done these visits. Now sales reps are being locked out. Um, but that's been the case for a long time for a myriad of different reasons. But pharmaceutical companies have, have always enjoyed access to physicians and be able to educate them. And people have been going to congresses and conferences. Now none of that is going on. I know that we're kind of you know, leaning into this idea of telemedicine as it relates to direct patient care. But how do you sort of see this, this kind of hybrid being used for education and engagement um, for peer influence, peer discussions, but education in general? I'm not sure I have a formal position on anything that you just asked about. I mean, I would say that everyone is in a similar boat in terms of so many folks that are working from home and building social connections in new ways. And so it sounds like the folks that you're asking about need to be innovative and need to be, you know, outreaching and networking just the way that all of us are doing, you know, through through Zoom and through personal contacts via phone and, and all of that. But I, I I don't know what else to say on what you just asked. I do want to comment before our time is up on um, the importance of thinking about for behavioral health, um, really thinking about um, flexible value-based payment models that uh, facilitate both integrated care and specialty behavioral health, um, enforcement of parity, um, and um, significantly increased investment in being able to address the social determinants of health, which have such great impact on all of healthcare, but on behavioral health specifically. Thank you. Important points. And Sam, any last views on anything that was discussed here, you know, in a more holistic view of what's next and what's, and what's forthcoming? Yeah, I think what I think in terms of the point on the cost, I think it is really important. I'm 100% with Dr. Block. It's super, it's a lot of work, time, and money to make telemedicine happen. So, this perception that you just, you're just FaceTiming with your patient is completely in, incorrect because of all the workflows, all the investment, all the time, all the change management and for providers who are going to continue to have a hybrid practice. It's different for the American Wells and the dock on demand of the world because they have, they have their set costs and then they're rolling it out in this way. This is very different from clinicians who could also use this model to be able to attract people from around the country. Dr. Block could be the best interventional pain physician who brings in people from multiple states around him, but he's going to have to have an infrastructure to be able to do that. That costs money. And so there's also this perception that, oh, well, once I do telehealth, I'm not using my nurse or my MA. No, totally not. Because in fact, the person who should be worried about the forms or can Mrs. Jones actually make this device work should be the scheduler, the nurse, the MA, those people so that we're all practicing at the top of our license. I'm not a clinician, so I don't have a license, but so that you're practicing appropriately and we're using your skill set for what it should be. So I'm 100%. It's not about we're trying to overutilize or take advantage of the situation, but the reality is, as it stands right now, telemedicine is a ton of work. And so we're not in a place where it's cheaper. It's 100% the people it's cheaper for, the patients and the insurance companies. Because if you get your care, 
appropriately and quickly, you cost the insurance company less money. So the people who benefit from these tools are not the providers at all. It is the people who pay the bills or the patients. Important point. This was absolutely a, a fascinating discussion. So many great perspectives on this. We are just on the precipice of this immense change in the healthcare space. And telemedicine is just the tip of the iceberg of so many great, exciting new things that are, await all of us in the healthcare space. And most of all, being very you know, patient-centric to the benefit ultimately of, of patient outcomes. So thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, for those people who are interested in listening around the table, we will be sharing links to the individuals. If you wanna reach out to any of them, ask more questions, see if you can uh, find out more about what they're doing. And also feel free to contact us at Impetus Digital. If you're interested in continuing these kinds of big, hairy, audacious discussions, we have the best asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. So you can have these ongoing longitudinal disruptive conversations over time so we can talk about things beyond the pill. And we can really truly do things to, to positively disrupt healthcare. So thanks to all of our panelists here. This was an absolutely outstanding conversation. And thanks for everybody attending today's session. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.